Hello, and welcome to IPN TV's Leadership Series. I'm your host, Shaina Saleem, and today I have the distinct pleasure of interviewing Mr. Kareem Budwani, CEO of Elixir International. Welcome to the show, Kareem, and thank you for being here. Thank you, Shaina. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, on a personal note, I must say that I'm really looking forward uh, to trying out some of these local coffee shops that Chairman Rahim has been talking about. Because in my opinion, the best coffee shops in the region are in Birmingham, but I'm going to keep an open mind. So okay, I'm, I'm looking yeah. forward to that after this interview. <laughs> Thank you for doing so. <laughs> well, um, Kareem, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Our viewers would love to know a little bit about you, but also about Elixir International. Okay. Um, I think you know this already that uh, about 18 years ago, Actually, in five days on Monday, uh, we will be 18 years old. Remarkable. Yeah, so thank you. So about 18 years ago, um, we started this company with a very simple idea. We just had a very simple, concise objective, which was to make this a greener, more efficient world through innovations. So that's all that we wanted to do. And, um, you know, we, we have been so passionate about this idea uh, that, you know, 18 years later, I think that it still is just as exciting to me today as it was back then. Um, we were all consultants at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, we were already uh, working with mid to large size organizations, mm -hmm. uh, streamlining their processes. Mm -hmm. um, and our goals at the time, uh, we had twin goals. Uh, one was to make people's lives easier, because uh, that's always good. And then the other one was to reduce the environmental footprint of most of these processes, and that we achieved by reducing paperwork. So oh. that was our our key driver. We were like really focused on that and really passionate. We just wanted to do that, and uh, so it was just natural to go ahead and start this company to do that as well. And so the rest is history, I guess, <laughs> when you started that. Very interesting. Thank you. It's, and it's also commendable, Karim, that you've taken an idea um, which generates income. Um, you know, you were a consultant, so you you know, you have been successful in every right, and then you chose to turn it into an entrepreneurial endeavor. Yeah. Now, being an entrepreneur myself, I often come across situations where uh, you don't want to give up, but you still have had enough. And, you know, there are certain challenges uh, or roadblocks that come your way. Have you experienced any of those? And, and what have you learned from any of those challenges or, or you know, second thoughts, if I could say? So, um, obviously, I think if there is uh, any endeavor in life, today, no matter what that is, to be a parent, for instance, uh, or, or anything, there are going to be um, challenges. Mm -hmm. And uh, those challenges are opportunities for us to become even better, I think, at what we do. I agree. Um, so most of these challenges, uh, I think, only help us become even better. And um, to know the kind of impact that we're having mm -hmm. is uh, it, another driver for us to keep moving forward. Um, and I'll, I'll talk to you about a, a challenge, for instance, right? So. I talked about the paperwork reduction. Mm -hmm. That was not so bad. But let's just say that you are the uh, owner of uh, a field service organization, mm -hmm. right, uh, here in uh, Georgia. Let's say it's a big operation and you have dispatch locations all over the mm -hmm. state. And um, let's just say you're running HVAC repair shops, yeah. as an example, mm -hmm. right? And what would happen typically is you would take the state of Georgia and carve it up in areas with a dispatch location either somewhere in the middle sure. of the area or whatever. But what happens, what used to happen a lot, is you would have one technician from one dispatch location drive all the way to the border of that area, and then you have another dispatcher goes all the way to the border on this side. Wouldn't it just be better if one or the other just took both the calls? Because now what you've done is you've got this guy driving all the way here, this guy driving, so you are actually wasting a lot of resources depleting the ozone, you know, in doing so. So this was a big challenge for us uh, at the time. And the way we solved that was uh, something that you and I and just about everybody would be very familiar with. I mean, the idea of a balloon. I'm sure we've all played with balloons. Mm -hmm. uh, my kids do, I know that they do. So think, if you think of the horizontal plane as mm -hmm. geography, and if you think of the vertical axis as time, you take this balloon, mm -hmm. and if you squeeze it, as in you want to service as many customers as possible, as quickly as possible, what has happened to the balloon is it has spread out in space. True. Right? So you're driving all over the place doing crazy things. If you squeeze the balloon this way, it's going to expand up in time. Exactly. You're going to make customers wait 10, 12 days, True. and you might lose those customers. So what we figured is, why don't we just take this hypothetical balloon, 
program it in the computer so it would dynamically change the shape. One day it's a puppy, one day it's a butterfly, whatever, to configure these calls both in space and time as they come in. And even incentivize customers to pick the days that are most favorable for us to come out there. That is very interesting. Yeah. So uh, yeah, so you know, you, you come across these challenges, which the, initially when you think about it, you're like, how am I gonna do this? But then you know, when you uh, work at it, mm -hmm. and when the aha moment occurs, it's remarkable. It is, you and it's very rewarding in its own sense. It absolutely I mean. is. Tell us um, just, a, just a few sentences about who your customers are and uh, what technology do you focus on? Okay, so we mo mainly focus on uh, mid to large size organizations, mm -hmm. and uh, we cater to the departmental needs of every organization. But we prefer now to work at least the front end components to be in .NET. And in the back, we uh, can support a host of different systems. So that's basically what we do. But most of what we do for our customers is uh, take the problem that they have, the mm -hmm. larger, more complex problem, and simplify it uh, in the best, most optimal configuration for them. So we understand what their technology landscape is like, what their business landscape is like, and then we come up with a solution that will work best within that context, and then we apply it. And I think the reason why, one of the reasons why I think we have been as successful, even in solving such difficult problems, mm -hmm. is because we're all very excited about this idea of making people's lives easier, and reducing the environmental footprint. So that just drives us, you know. True. It sounds like reducing the environmental footprint was something, you know, or is something that you're passionate about. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about what drives you uh, in this direction and, and in your passion. Okay. So <clears throat> I think that this would be, uh, uh, for just about anybody, I think the, um, the idea is that you want to leave the world a better place than you inherited. Exactly. So you're constantly moving in that direction. Now, of course, and this is something that I mentioned uh, on many occasions. You know, when you talk about passion, and when you talk about following your passion, and when you talk about success, you know, passion is a tango, and it takes two to tango. Mm -hmm. It's not just that you pursue your passion, but it's also uh, pragmatism. You have to keep both of those in, uh, in line to have this nice, elegant uh, sequence. Uh, you cannot forsake one for the other. I mean, and think about it, right? Because uh, if you've got a lifeless partner in a tango, it's not gonna, uh, it, it's not gonna look, very, uh, look very good. So when you think of passion driving success, mm -hmm. um, you have to think of a tango, and it takes two to tango. That's, that's a very, very, very beautiful analogy that you've portrayed here. Thanks. I also found a very interesting fact about you, the fact that you are pursuing two PhDs. I mean, you know, pursuing a PhD in itself is a mammoth task, and you're pursuing two. Um, tell us what you're pursuing your PhD in, uh, PhDs in, and uh, you know, and why. Okay. Um, I think I should probably um, so continuing on the tango first, mm -hmm. and then maybe this will kind of make sense. So one part I, I did mention was pragmatism, and we talked about uh, how you want to uh, keep that in mind, but even the other side, the passion side. It's just not enough to say that you're passionate about something, but you have to actually work toward that. Uh, there are many uh, books that have been published uh, that talk about how to become how to become a master mm -hmm. at something. But you should want to become an expert, uh, not that you would have to become an expert. That's what would drive the passion. And one way that you can become an expert, I think, is that you obviously gain as much knowledge in that subsector specialization that you're working on. Sure. But then you also want to look at the subsectors that touch your particular area, even though you're not directly engaged in that. And then you want to go even further and look at the sectors uh, and how the interplay of all of these uh, different sectors could have an impact on what you are doing and could have an impact on what somebody else around the world, perhaps, might be facing you know, in the next 5, 10, 20 years. And you want to start getting into the mode of analyzing those trends, mm -hmm. monitoring those trends, mm -hmm. and see how well you predict the outcomes. True. Uh, and uh, you know, you want to, at some point what happens is, as you're looking at this data, you are able to translate that data natively into knowledge. Mm -hmm. You're able to sift out the signal from the noise, and then other faculties come into play, and that knowledge becomes wisdom. And I think that this, this flow uh, mm -hmm. from data, raw data, to knowledge, to wisdom, 
it just becomes a natural point now to the um, issue about the research so one of the things that I talked about a little earlier is that you want to leave the world better than you inherited so when you're talking about pragmatism you need mm -hmm. the income and uh, good news is we also have the passion on that end too but there's the other dynamic which is that of impact and uh, when i was looking at the healthcare sector just as i was examining all these sectors that interplay with technology and uh, management and things like that i was looking at healthcare mm -hmm. and then within healthcare while i was diving into that uh, sector i realized that there is a lot of white space in the area of cancer Got it. that uh, if we could perhaps take what we have learned from management consulting from uh, technology solutions from optimizations and if you could take those lessons and apply them you cannot photocopy them but if you can take them adapt them and apply them mm -hmm. that we could actually gain a lot and we could make significant progress hopefully uh, in the battle against cancer and the reason why it's two uh, PhDs and not one is um, I would like to make chemotherapy, as an example, I would like to make chemotherapy safer and more effective. Mm -hmm. So what I'm doing may not add a single day to a patient's life. It may not. It, will, it may not increase the quantity of life. But you know what? There are days, months, and years of treatment leading up to that final day for the patient. So what I want to try to do is those last years, months, and days, if I can add to the quality of life mm -hmm. so that they can still be productive members of society, they can have a great time with their friends and family and also enjoy their lives. I think that to me would be remarkable. So that's what I want to do. I want to make chemotherapy safer mm -hmm. and more effective, but I wanted a meaningful, quick way to also test my crazy ideas. You know, so I'm doing all this stuff. How do I know if it works? Uh, now there are animal models and then there are in vitro systems. Mm -hmm. But in my opinion, there wasn't a platform that was quick, easy and effective mm -hmm. uh, that I could use to test these ideas. So that's the other PhD. I want to build a tumor model, uh, and this could be any organ model actually outside the body. So nobody would have to have cancer for me to test it. And then when I have these uh, uh, mechanisms ready, I could test it on that platform and see if it works. And the reason why I also want to keep that platform extremely inexpensive is because I would like for this technology to be readily available in the developing world as well. You know, we have seven and a half billion people on this planet. Each one of them is an asset to society. Each one of them has a brain. If we could make these platforms accessible and uh, cheap, by accessible I also mean cheap, then we could have people all over the world participating in this fight against diseases, you know? So that's the reason why uh, you know, I had to do both. Indeed, a very noble thought. And, you know, the sad reality of the world is that cancer has touched, you know, pretty much everyone we know has known somebody who's, who's grappled with this disease, families impacted by it. So it's very heartwarming to, to know that you're doing something in that, in that realm. Um, you know, it's a good segue to, to talk about, you know, we all grow up with certain values, mm -hmm. those instilled by our families, our parents. Uh, we acquire some with our friends, we acquire some with our spouses, our families, our extended families, mm -hmm. and, and then and some that we acquire through our work ethics and our mm -hmm. communities. Are there values that you uphold close to you that you would like to share with our viewers? Okay, that's a very interesting question. So um, as you were discussing uh, aspects of work ethics, mm -hmm. um, I think we talked about passion and pragmatism, but there is a, there's a very interesting story from uh, my childhood, and I am glad you reminded me of this. Um, and uh, you know, so when I talk, when I answered my first question, I took you back 18 years. Mm -hmm. For this one, I'm going to take you back 1,500 years. Okay. <laughs> so apparently, the legend goes that there is this guy who comes to the mosque mm -hmm. to pray, and uh, he asks the prophet, Prophet mm -hmm. Muhammad, says, "You know, I am a really faithful guy, uh, and I'm come here to pray. Is it okay if I just leave my camel here, go pray, and then come out when my camel still be here?" And the prophet answers very simply. He goes, "Tie the camel first. And then have faith. Then have faith. <laughs> and I think that that's, that's you know that gets to the income and True. impact uh, dynamic and the passion True. and pragmatism dynamic. True. I think that you want to be able to, and I think that's perhaps one of the things that has influenced mm -hmm. me, influenced me, in the uh, the decision making that that has led me to where I am today. And then there's the other aspect. I think we touched upon. Every human being is an asset to society. True. I think everybody uh, has their competitive advantages, what I call superpowers. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, your superpowers may be different from my superpowers, you know? And I think that we need to identify what is it that we can contribute to society uh, and then how do we build upon that mm -hmm. uh, so that we can contribute from an, in, from an impact perspective but also from drawing an income perspective. I think it is, it is extremely important to know what your superpowers are, build them and then use them for the betterment of society that is going to lead to income because you know people are going to provide uh, they are going to pay for the services that they value True. and if you're good at it why not do it and then also from an impact perspective so that you can leave this planet better than what you inherited exactly and, and a lot of entrepreneurs especially successful ones say when you generate value yeah. the wealth will come yeah. and i'm wondering if you believe in that same i, I, I totally do but again with a caveat the pragmatism has to be there mm -hmm. i think that it's very good to be passionate but you have to make sure that you that you have to make a living too. You know, I talked about the, the lifeless tango partner. And think about that. <laughs> you know, you could be very passionate, but you know, you have a lifeless True. tango partner, True. and it's just not going to be fun. But yes, I agree. I I don't think that chasing the dollar should be anybody's ideal. I think that that is something. It's like a, a cat chasing a tail, never being able to catch it, or simply walking and the tail just following it. And I think that that is, uh, that is what I believe too. I, I don't really care that much about wealth, uh, but I do care about having a good quality of life mm -hmm. uh, for me and for my kids. And I think that we will work toward that. But what's more important to me also is to be able to use everything that I have at my disposal mm -hmm. to make this a better world. True. To, to, to make a lasting impact. Now, you know, I've truly enjoyed this conversation. I, I will Thank have you, one too. more question yeah. for you. I won't leave you without that. Is um, help our viewers uh, by, by sharing, you know, some advice for them uh, or some parting comments that we could utilize in our lives. Okay. I would like to first recap. I think uh, we did touch upon really good uh, points and I really appreciate you asking, uh, asking me here, first of all, and uh, bringing up some of these really good memories too. So I really appreciate that. But I think that, uh, you know, we have to remember that the success through passion is a tango, that you cannot have one partner uh, forsaken. You know, you have to keep both of them uh, in line, in tandem. And then you have to also not just be thinking about income, mm -hmm. but also impact, because you do want to leave this world better than you inherited. And I think that uh, when you talk about uh, passion, it just, doesn't need to be ideas uh, that you're extremely excited about, but also what you do with those ideas. You know, uh, you know, you have to try to become an expert. And it shouldn't be very difficult because these are your superpowers, right? Uh, I'll give you an example. I, we were just having a dinner last night with some friends and we were having a similar conversation and uh, it came up that we were just discussing what were each other's strengths. and. Uh, you know, it wasn't very difficult for me to come up with this, that some people see trees, some people see forests. I see photosynthesis. I actually see the mechanisms that keep these trees and forests alive and how the entire ecosystem cooperates to keep us going. And I think that's my superpower. But, you know, everybody's superpower is going to be different. different. And I think you have to find that superpower, cultivate it, nurture it, because that is what's going to help you have a rewarding life and also going to be good for society. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for spending thank the time so much. with us. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. I've truly enjoyed the conversation and I'm sure the viewers will enjoy it too. I hope so. I certainly hope so. Thank you for joining us today and we hope to bring you another leadership series very soon from IPN TV. For more information, please look at our website and our Facebook page and our social media outlets. Thank you. Thank you.